Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. This episode, we are diving back into our workbook series for how to meet yourself. And if you are just joining us or tuning in, we have been going into a deep dive of our new workbook, which you can find at howtomeetyourself.com that will link various retailers also around the world for you to purchase. And if you do not have this new workbook, How to Meet Yourself, then that is entirely okay. We've actually intentionally created these episodes so that we can pull the content from the pages and still give access to as many people around the world, whether or not you have access to the actual physical copy of the book. Last episode in our How to Meet Yourself workbook series, we began a discussion on the ego, how to begin ego work. We will be continuing in a conversation of the ego and this episode designating it to meeting our shadow, which much like the ego is something that we want to work to integrate and almost befriend in our healing journey. So if you are following along, we are beginning on page 123, meet your shadow of section three in the workbook. I'm actually when I was sitting here listening to you intro it, the word counterpart kind of po popped into my head I when, saw I, you smile. when I think about the shadow because in a lot of ways, um, the shadow is the ego's counterpart, though the shadow is often overlooked, um, pun intended. We'll talk a little bit about what the shadow is, though I think it also is given a really bad rap, but much like the ego, and I suggest anyone tuning into those episodes, there is so much value and so much we can learn as we begin to non-judgmentally, of course, view these aspects of ourself. Because much like the ego, I've yet to meet a human being who doesn't have a shadow. And what the shadow really is simply, as often is the case, the shadow consists of all of the denied or repressed. So all of the parts of ourself that are kept out of our own awareness. We don't even realize oftentimes these things about ourselves. And of course, why do we end up denying aspects of ourself or repressing them, keeping them outside of our conscious awareness, usually because of our early childhood environments, our relationships, and in particular, the different messaging that we received about those particular parts. And some of us might have heard very directly certain aspects of ourselves celebrated, other aspects of ourselves called bad or wrong or immoral, whatever the language is. And other times it isn't as direct. Sometimes Things aren't said specifically or explicitly, though we're made to feel that certain aspects of ourself are, again, bad or are shameful. And then, of course, what we do is we project those parts of ourself onto other people. And when we're scrolling on the Internet or meeting people in our you know, interpersonal circles or our social circles, we then often notice a reaction you know, we might even label these people as certain things. They're arrogant, they're greedy. And what we're really doing is we're highlighting an aspect of, of them, their personhood, a, a part of themselves that we're responding or reacting negatively to. Of course, then the theory behind this is we're seeing this part in someone else and we're reacting this way to someone else because those are parts of ourself that, again, at one time in one place, weren't accepted, were not safe for us to express. And really quickly, because I think this is a, a side of the shadow that is often even more in the shadows, if you will, shadows doesn't always just include the bad or the shameful parts of ourselves. For some of us, there's actually, quote unquote, good qualities that because, again, of our early childhood environments and messaging, we weren't safe to express. And I think the common example that comes to mind are the many of us who maybe had creative talents or, you know, aspects of our being that in childhood for many different reasons, because it quote unquote, couldn't pay the bills or we're wasting time or energy, whatever it was or is, or had been, we then deny those parts of ourselves too. Similarly, again, projecting on them onto others and reacting in some kind of way. But I think it's important to um, expand the definition as we all often do to include those good parts as well, because some of us, that is an aspect of our true self-expression that because of those early environments, we weren't safe to express. That last example in particular that you gave immediately hit home and made me think of all of the creatives in the world who have an attachment or a likeness 
associated between their creativity and their wounding and their pain. I love to write as a cathartic practice and can look back on how I had done that even as little Jenna. It's just an outlet that I would go to. And only in the times of immense pain or abuse was I able to actually access words or articulate onto a piece of paper what it was that I was experiencing. And all of that flow of creativity and expression that is this beautiful essence that I have, that Nicole will have, that's uniquely hers, and each of you will have, that's uniquely you, for many who do grow up in a highly dysfunctional or dysfunctional in any way environment where there is trauma or abuse or neglect, often that creativity gets bottled up and pushed into that time of wounding and loneliness, which we're compacting into these darkest shadow parts of ourselves. Yeah, and I think to to kind of expand it even more, because I think oftentimes, and many of you listening, and I know at one time, there was a part of me that the second I heard creativity, I would have turned my ears off because <laughs> that didn't apply to me. So also what kind of goes into this category of the good stuff, and of course I'm putting quotes up because I don't really love to categorize good and bad, though it could be things outside of even what we traditionally think of when we think of in terms of creativity. It could be our nurturing right, side of ourself, our kindness, right? Just aspects of who we are inherently that for whatever reason, those parts didn't fit. They weren't nurtured. They weren't safe to express in our early childhood environment. So, you know, imagining that many of you now, maybe with this expanded definition, might even see instances of things that make you uniquely you, that can and are celebrated aspects of yourself that you might not necessarily be celebrating as of yet because of what you've been taught or conditioned to believe about these aspects of yourself. I, it's so beautiful to expand what creativity is. And we could probably, <laughs> if we haven't already done a whole episode on creativity, because as you just said, that's a great example, motherhood. What more beautiful or dynamic of a creative expression could you have than motherhood cultivating a, a child in the world or bringing a child into the world, choosing to nurture them, and then your own growth and flourishing that happens in that interpersonal relationship with the child. So really, it's expanded across always. Creative doesn't mean a paintbrush or um, you know, an artist or a writer online, it can, it's really your essence. So I love that you use air quotes. I'm always so hesitant. <laughs> Every time we say good or bad, I know those of you who are listening can't see us, but it doesn't, nothing really does land on a spectrum. And if you have good, you only know good because you have bad and you only have bad because you have good. So you have to have all of it in general. So we can really pull the good, bad label right off and just have a more connected coherent conversation in understanding that it's our essence, that true authentic self, the thing that does make me show up as Jenna in the world, that kind of heart-centered flow when you're in your flow, whatever that looks like for you in different professions, careers, how you just are in existence that is all your creative expression. So it's interesting to notice as we get into meeting your actual shadow, if it does apply to you or you do notice that connection in how you're expressed in the world, where it is connected at the root to your shadow or how it could be connected to your shadow parts. And I think as we're getting ready to dive in and actually go through the exploratory exercises of meeting our shadow, much like we kind of prefaced or the disclaimer of the ego episodes is going to apply here as well, which is while, again, I think the shadow even more so than the ego has been vilified, villainized, right? We even judge and shame ourselves when we see ourselves judging and shaming other people quite often like dominoes. The preface of disclaimer here again is to the shadow, right, has been created out of our very real early experiences of, about around very real shame, that so many of us are still carrying with us around those particular parts of ourselves. So when we're talking about doing shadow work, just like when we were talking about doing ego work, we're not talking about killing it, shaming ourselves because it's present. We're really talking in the word we use with ego is integrate it. We're talking about learning how to be in observance of because our shadow is there. 
even though it's repressed outside of most of our awareness, it is there in moments. Even if we're not shaming or, you know, leaving negative snarky comments on the person who we're projecting on, there are ways that it is impacting us. So the more present we can become to it, and again, the more then we can shift and create space, not for more shaming of those parts, for actual acceptance of those parts. Because the goal isn't to remove those parts that are intrinsically part of us. The goal now is to have a new relationship with those parts an accepting one, a compassionate one, one where maybe over time we can even sit in celebration of these aspects that make us uniquely the being that each of us are. I just want to give a moment to let those words <laughs> sink in. We gave a visual last episode for the ego. Imagine being in the car and your ego's in the driver's seat. And the goal is not to rip the steering wheel out of the ego's hands, but to, you know, Gently get the steering wheel back in your control and first validate and acknowledge that that ego's there and no, it's not there to harm you. It was formed for a reason. So now that we can see we're in the car with our ego, we are now making room for our shadow, the shadow parts of ourselves. So what you just said so beautifully, Nicole, immediately gave me a, like a celebratory image of <laughs> me, little Jenna, my ego, all of my shadow parts crammed into a car, <laughs> but in a joyful way, you know, a little curmudgeon, like we're all squished in here, but like, hey, you're here. You're part of her too. We are all part of this beautiful whole being. So maybe that visual could help you out. Leave the doors open. <laughs> let all of the parts of yourself that are already there, they've been waiting for you to open the door and allow them in. So it's nothing new that's coming up. It's new that you're able to access and recall it or new that you're even spending time choosing to recall it and be immersed in this curiosity. So this next section is on page 126. And for the sake of giving you this content so you can access it if you do not have the workbook, I'm going to read this whole section directly off the page. So this is a series of inquiry and reflection questions for you to meet your unique shadow. If you are listening to this and are able to pause and grab a pen and paper or want to pull up a notepad, I know many of you take notes to integrate and use this work later, or you can just check back into the replay of this episode. And if you are following along, we're on page 126 of the workbook, How to Meet Yourself. So shadow work, meet your shadow. Spend time exploring the following questions. Some of these answers might not come to you right away, and that's okay. Be in the inquiry. Allow yourself to immerse in the sea of curiosity. You can always bookmark this page or this podcast and come back to it. The more open you are to this work, the clearer the answers will become. The more time you spend in intentional inquiry here, the more these answers will come to you. Now remember what Nicole said a few moments before. This is while we often go to the judging and the critiquing of ourselves, and then the judging and critiquing of ourselves, judging and critiquing ourselves, we want to do our best to turn the volume down on this already functioning habit that likely will happen Turn the volume down, set it aside, refocus your attention on just being in a wide open space to allow whatever reality is there to come. This is an opportunity for you in real time to actually do two practices and to be the wise, loving, and nurturing inner parent to yourself and allow space for radical honesty in your responses. The questions are as follows. What do you think are some of the worst traits, characteristics, or behaviors a person can have? What traits, characteristics, or behaviors don't you like about yourself? So what traits, characteristics, and behaviors do you not like about yourself? What traits do you see in people that you notice yourself always feeling envious of? or that you wish you had? What do you see in other people? What traits do you see in other people that you're always wishing you had to, or maybe you had instead? What are you most proud of, or what do you feel is your greatest accomplishment? If none come to mind, allow that to be. If one, two, three, or more come to mind, write them all down. 
the more you write down in your responses is more inquiry. It's more gold and more feedback for you to use in your own journey. Next question. What do you believe this accomplishment means about you? So whatever you thought was your greatest accomplishment, what do you think that means about you? Next question. If ever there was a time when you were young and felt badly about yourself, stupid, foolish, aloof, or embarrassed, what happened? What did you think about yourself and how did you feel? So think of a time maybe when you were young and you felt badly about yourself, embarrassed, foolish. What were you thinking about yourself? What happened in that experience and how did you feel? What do you think about failure or making mistakes? How do you feel when you fail or make a mistake? Do you accept failure and mistakes as part of your life? Or do you feel yourself consumed by fears of them? Next question. What traits, characteristics, or behaviors make you feel the most insecure? What traits, what behaviors, what characteristics make you feel the most insecure? Next question. If ever there was a time when you were young, when people commented on aspects of you that were, quote, wrong, bad, negative, or that you should change, what was it that they said? How did you feel? So recalling a time when you're young, if ever someone commented on aspects of you that were wrong, bad, needed to be changed, what was it that was said to you and how did you feel? Do you find yourself still trying to change these aspects of yourself today? Next page and our last three questions. What traits, characteristics, or behaviors did your parent figures idealize? or think and speak highly of when you were a child? Did they idealize money or success? Work ethic? Having nice material things? Being, quote, strong or, quote, not weak? High achievement or good grades? Self-sacrifice or being, quote, selfless? What did they idealize? Now remember, parent is also parent figure, the adult caregivers that were around you and your family system and community. What traits, characteristics, or behaviors do you idealize? How do you attempt to meet these idealized standards? Last question. How easily did you, quote, fit in growing up? Or how accepted or rejected did you feel by your peers or friends? How did you feel? Why did you imagine you were being accepted or rejected? Even just sitting here, I was noticing myself kind of mentally going through um, some of these answers and even sitting with this last one, you know, really bringing back for me very early in life, not feeling very accepted and now just exploring for just a moment, you know, how that really then opened up a door for me to become whoever it was that I imagined would be a person who was accepted. It was almost like this blank slate where I had, where I had the idea that there was such a shame about all of me, the wholeness of me, that it almost gave me this kind of blank slate to, yeah, be much like a chameleon, be the, you know, person in high school who was friends with all different groups. Mm -hmm. And without going too much into my journey, and of course, stay tuned um, for next actual episode that we're going to be recording and releasing where we will be exploring both of our individual healing journeys of our ego and our shadow. But that's just coming to mind. And really, you know, thinking of all of the ways and imagining many of you listeners, shame, right? Such an intrinsic part of ourself. If we didn't have the safety and security in childhood and didn't get the message that overwhelmingly our wholeness, whatever part of ourself it was, is okay, then ultimately we probably have the remnant of this living in our shadow self. And I think it's actually really interesting to consider all of the different more quote unquote positive right? Ways where we've learned to idealize certain aspects, even hero worship, I, especially being, I think, in a culture where the word guru is really thrown around, how so often what we're seeing in other people that we think is absent in ourselves, these people, these gurus, right, that we're idolizing and, you know, following. Ultimately, it's so, it's so interesting because all of those parts that we're idealizing in someone else live inside each of us. So that's an interesting, I think, area for me to even continue to explore in my own shadow journey. 
And continuing now on in the workbook, for those of you who are following along from page 129, um, the next exercise now after we witness or meet our shadow, now we can begin to witness or see our shadow in action. And again, I'm going to read these prompts right from this workbook page. Um, so you can pause, follow along, write these down. We can see our shadow through others and our daily interactions with them. Noticing the thoughts that come up when we're around friends, family, and strangers will allow us to, to discover parts of ourselves that we haven't yet seen. We can notice what comes up when we consume information through social media, television, or movies. Doing this can cause a profound shift in your life because most of us unconsciously take in information or interact with the world around us. It's through conscious reflection on these experiences that we gain a deeper awareness of their influence and meaning. The behavior we engage in often has an emotional payoff. Usually, our behavior is based in a desire to satisfy an unmet need. Typically, this motivation is unconscious, and we are not aware of why we do the things that we do. So, in this exercise, we are going to work on becoming conscious of our unconscious motives. So, I'm going to read some sentences with a blank and invite each of you to take some time, similarly to the previous exercise, if nothing comes to mind immediately, non-judgmentally, grant yourself patience and compassion as you explore what could come up for you in each of these areas, and also inviting each of you to witness yourself in action and actually explore in real time during, around each of these prompted areas and see for yourself what is actually happening. So here are the prompts. Begin to notice, I mostly consume content about blank. Now, of course, you can investigate, explore for yourself. What is the topics of the content that you typically are finding yourself consuming? I mostly consume content about blank, and the emotional payoff I get is feeling blank. Again, spend some time with yourself to see, explore with yourself what feelings might come up when you're consuming particular content around a particular subject. Next prompt. In my closest relationships, we are usually bonding over blank. Again, what is it that you're usually talking about? How often what do you feel close? How do you feel closest to those in your relationships? Are there particular topics or experiences that you notice sharing? So in my closest relationships, we are usually bonding over blank and the emotional payoff is feeling blank. Again, take some time to explore what do you feel as a result of what you're bonding over. Next prompt. When I post on social media, for all, all of you out there who post on social media or really anything, when you share something more publicly, as is the case in social media, I'm usually posting things about blank. Again, other particular topics, experiences, what is it that you typically find yourself sharing more publicly or more socially? When I post on social media, I'm usually posting about blank. And again, the emotional payoff is feeling blank. Next prompt. When I'm alone, I usually think about blank. Begin to notice, are there themes that particularly come up for you when you're alone? Th themes, experiences, what is it that you're thinking about when you're alone? When I'm alone, I usually think about blank and the emotional payoff is feeling blank. And offering everyone the suggestion to be compassionate with yourself, whatever it is that you're noticing come up as you explore each of these prompts. And the final prompt, when I talk negatively about someone, I'm usually talking about blank. So anytime you're gossiping or you're sharing whatever negativity about anyone else, someone you know, someone that you don't know. What is it that you're noticing and what is it that you're talking about? What are you finding so negative or so repulsive? When I talk negatively about someone, I'm usually talking about blank and the emotional payoff 
is feeling blank. Again, gift yourself with compassion as you explore these. Take time to explore these. And an overall final question then to begin to explore as you're seeing maybe patterns in each of these areas, topics that you tend to focus on, things you tend to notice, ways you tend to feel. Again, reminding ourselves that oftentimes, right, our shadow in action is reactive to a deeper unmet need. There is some information that it is giving us. So now you can begin to dive in, right, down into that iceberg and maybe begin to explore the question being, why might I be engaging in these patterns? What is it about myself that I may be struggling to accept, love, or acknowledge? Reminding each of us that to accept ourself is an unmet need, is a need, the need for acceptance, the need for inclusion, the need to be a whole being loved and connected to the world around us. So for many of us, that is the unmet need. We don't yet accept or love, or feel compassion to these parts of ourselves. So begin to explore these patterns. What are these patterns telling us? What might it be showing us about aspects of ourself that we don't yet feel worthy or we feel too shameful of to express in the world around us? I really appreciate you for reading these and everyone who's watching and listening, who is here for this conversation and who genuinely listened to those questions and gave this some thought or who didn't. And, you know, maybe you judged all the way through listening to them or had a whole conversation in your head. I also thank you because you're here for a reason and tuning into this for a reason. And that's that same likeness and resonance that um, you were saying it earlier in much different words. And I just kept replaying, if you spot it, you got it. Mm -hmm. And it's that, in the same way, the things that we admire or envy in another, when people are having a hard time envisioning their greatest or highest self, my suggestion is always think of the people you admire. Look around you who you sort of idolize and really look up to. What are those traits? What are the behaviors and characteristics about them? Because you can only have that ping and that resonance and likeness if also it's igniting something here, it's responding to something in here. So it already is within you. And that I think is a, a helpful cushion to take on your meeting your shadow journey with you when you do open the doors to this car, allowing in all parts of you, especially the parts who have been so shunned into the darkest parts of ourselves. They're only back there in that darkness because we haven't yet opened a door for them to let in some light and say, hey, I'm here now. I know you're here. Thank you for being here. You arrived for a reason and it was to protect me. So now I see you. You're here. We got ego in the passenger mm -hmm. seat. We're all in this ride together and can really bring an opportunity for us to extend some love and compassion to ourselves and also to each other. Because what you just said, choosing yourself is, that's the first step. You are only on a journey of healing when you have an unwavering commitment to now begin choosing yourself. And that doesn't just mean canceling plans and making a spa day for yourself or sitting in silence to meditate. It means choosing all parts of yourselves, especially these shadow parts here. So thank you all for tuning into this conversation um, and for really embarking on bringing to light and normalizing what seems to have been such a shadowed and taboo conversation until now. <laughs> Fun intended. <laughs> um, but I really do want to emphasize that because so many of us are looking for acceptance, for love from the outside, right? from our mm -hmm. partners, from our families. We want all of ourselves to be loved, yet we have so much that's outside of our own awareness, parts of ourself that we don't yet love, um, that we don't yet even many of us accept. And to love something, we first have to learn how to be present with it. And that's the beautiful thing is that all parts of ourself are, are worthy. And I'm having a giggle at you saying you spot it, you got it. I'm sitting here for those of you who are watching this with a shirt that says your unconscious is showing. And again, out of kind of a representation of even if we are so good at, you know, keeping our attention away from these very shameful aspects, it doesn't make them go away. It is coming out in 
all of the ways. Um, coloring oftentimes our experience of even other people. Um, definitely our experience of ourself in our relationship. Because if we're not showing all of ourselves, there's all of the parts of ourself that is left out that is feeling unworthy, that's continuing to be validated in its unworthiness. So I want to emphasize again, as we're getting ready to end here, the journey, um, as is all the case with all things healing. This is not, I do not suggest these exercises that we just read through to be a one and done. Um, this practice, whether we're talking about the ego or its shadow side, of course, is about living in that conscious state, being able to in real time notice when something deeper is happening that's causing a reaction and that's causing your habitual behavior. Because it's in those moments, um, oftentimes in our closest relationships, where those mirrors are brought up to ourselves and where we can gain so much from pausing to understand what might be happening. So I invite all of you and celebrate all of you like you just did, Jenna, for each of us who are embarking on this journey because it is a journey. And again, when we begin to embrace all that is us, then we can give that gift of love, true love to other people around us. And a little insert at the end, reminder that while we're talking about our shadow parts and like Nicole's shirt says, your unconscious is showing. And I was giggling thinking, well, <laughs> While we all have our own unique journeys, your shadow parts will be unique to you, but they're also universal in their uniqueness. We all experience them. And usually the first thing when we know something that we didn't know or we learn something or immerse into this inquiry, we want to run and shower it on everyone <laughs> around us. We also have an unconscious expectation. A lot of us do with good intention for them to do this work too, to see it too. I gave the sunglasses imagery on last podcast and it's, or on a couple of them. And it's the same thing. You're say your shadow parts are pairs of sunglasses through which you're seeing the world, you can only remove your own sunglasses. You can only open the doors to your own car and let everybody in. <laughs> this is the work for you. It may inspire, you may notice a, a likeness around you of other people beginning to model what you're doing. That could perhaps happen. It's not always a guarantee though the focus is only to be here on yourself because that's the only thing that we have access to. And it's also the one relationship that most of us have tossed completely <laughs> to the back burner and have been running and catering to everyone else around us and leaving all of us, our ego, our shadow, our little us, just back in a corner or in the trunk of our car. So this is time and space to really honor yourself first and begin healing from that or an inside out, and then begin to see how the external world changes around us. So thank you all for listening, for tuning in. We love you, and we will see you on next week's episode.